Good morning, and I greet you in the loving and precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many in the house of God has got victory? Amen. Come on now. How many has got victory? If you've got victory, give God glory. Give Him praise with a clap off of this blessed day. Let your hands all your people shout with a loud voice of triumph. From the words of God, from the New Testament, from Timothy. But God, creator of the heavens and the earth. God who give us life this morning, Brother Jackie. But God who created the heavens and the earth. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We're serving a mighty God to the pulling down of stronghold. Stand your feet, everyone, here in the presence of God the Father. I look out across the congregation. God's been good to us and the church and the body of Christ. Lift your hands and praise Him and thank Him, Heavenly Father. As we come into your house, let us enter the gates and courts with praise and with thanksgiving, God. You let me live another day to come into your presence. You spoke the breath of life into my lungs. I give you praise from the depths of my heart. Almighty God, I pray for the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost to flow from the stage to the back pew. Touch every need, every home, and every flame. Those that may be lost here today, God save them and deliver them from the powers of darkness. And before we leave the house of God, let us give you glory and honor and praise this blessed day in Jesus' loving and precious name we do pray. And the church and the body of Christ, if you have got the victory, give God a great big clap over here this blessed, blessed day. Turn and shake your neighbor's hand tell us have church here this blessed day in the house of God. Crystal River, take your loop if you would please. Oh, my God. 
Give Crystal River these men a great big hand. If you will please in the house of God. How many trust in the Lord? Got yeah, faith in the Lord. Yeah. The word of God said, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. From the New Testament, from Hebrews chapter 11, this is the faith chapter. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God, that things were seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it would be dead yet speaking. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation. He had this testimony that he pleased God. How many in this house wants to please God here this blessed day? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. To please who? To please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and he that it is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. God is a rewarder in this house. I don't care what you're going through. God can bless you. God can turn it around. Oh Lord God, give him praise in the house of God. That's a God that we're serving with us in. Crystal River, take your liberty please.
This is God's house and he's not of Israel. How many feels the Holy Ghost presence of God here this blessed day? From the New Testament, from Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. The same day when the evening was come, he said to them, Let us go to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in a ship. And there was also with him other ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in Jesus and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Yes. And he arose, he stood up and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, this is Jesus speaking, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Amen. Yeah. How many is he ever when you cried out to him? He stood up for you. Amen. And when he spoke, there was peace and there was a great calm. Amen. When the storms of life was coming against you, trying to destroy you, Lord God, give him a great weekend here. This blessed day, he's worthy of it. Can somebody say amen? Let me say people we got in this house. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Crystal River, take your liberty, please. Go, oh, hallelujah. I feel God in this house this morning.
to be in his house and in his holy presence. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. 1 Tim Timothy, the first chapter, begin with the 11th verse. According to the glorious gospel to the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning and ask God to anoint me, eternal Father? It is with praise and thanksgiving that we approach you this morning. We ask you, Lord, for a short space of time to anoint us with that spirit that makes preaching easy. God, touch the hearts and the lives and the minds of your people. Let us leave this place, dear God, victorious over hell, death, and the grave, and knowing it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Give him praise for his word. I want to speak to you this morning on the thought of a life of excitement or a life of dread. If you read both, both of Paul's letters to the young evangelist named Timothy, you'll quickly see that the apostle understood that he was both training and preparing Timothy for a very important mission. As we read all the deep instruction conveyed to this young man by way of the two epistles that were addressed to him. It is apparent that Paul realized that he had been called to be Timothy's mentor. The ten verses that precede our text speak of a mission that Paul had required of Timothy. While the apostle had moved on to Macedonia, he had charged his young successor to remain in Ephesus where he was to see that the church received correct doctrine. For in that church there were those who desired to teach others what they did not understand themselves. And although Paul does not elaborate much on what the subject of this erroneous teaching was, he says enough to make it apparent that it had something to do with the law. Having both given Timothy instruction and warning him in verses 1 through 10, suddenly Paul seems to move from instruction to personal testimony. As the apostle moves from verse 10 to verse 11, a fire begins to burn in his soul. Any believer who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit can not only hear it, but feel it take place in verse 11. From instruction concerning the purpose of the law to a feeling of unexplainable gratitude, the apostle moves from a positive position of duty as Timothy's mentor providing instruction. Paul's attention turns to the glory of his own calling into the kingdom of God. How often do we stop and consider the glory of being called out of darkness to stand in the marvelous light of God. How often do we stop and give God praise for looking down upon us in our sad condition and making us one of His own? Suddenly His mind shifts away from the problems of overseeing the churches to the glory of being counted worthy
the uh, uh, being a part of it. Suddenly, uh, the pressures uh, of providing instruction to self-will defiant people uh, is eclipsed by the glory uh, of a personal relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, how often do we stop and consider uh, in a day's time that we have uh, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? We're not honey for Him, nor is He honey for us, but He abides in our hearts. He abides in our lives. Is that worth praise? Is that worthy of a praise? Yes. Put your hands together and give God praise for the opportunity. From a strong discourse on the purpose of the law, Paul moves into a spirit of thanksgiving and the ends, verse 10, by speaking to things contrary to sound doctrine. And he opens verse 11 by boasting of the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to his own trust. As I speak to this congregation this morning, all of us are aware of the difficulties in Encountered by those who would walk upright before the Lord. Even Paul himself was familiar with the sufferings of this present time, which he addresses in Romans 8 and 18. Even this powerful apostle was aware of the fact that the outward man perishes every day. Although many have tried, you cannot make this Christ like walk an easy venture. If it were easy, then everyone would be walking in it. Nowhere in Scripture will you find the Lord uh, promising that the cross uh, that you and I bear uh, or commanded to carry uh, would not be heavy. Nowhere will you hear Him say uh, that our hills uh, would not be hard to climb. If you and I read uh, the book, we will find that because of Adam's sin, a curse was placed upon this world world and you and I live in a temporal body upon this world. Oh, but be comforted today because I did bring some good news inside this temporal being that feels pain, that feels sorrow, that feels disappointment. We have a treasure hidden. Can somebody amen. say amen? amen? Dear God, it's hidden in an earthen vessel. We're carrying it around as we make our way through this present world. Give God praise for the treasure this morning. Because there's a treasure hidden in a vessel of clay. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, Paul said, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Our inward man is not destroyed by the loss of worldly things. Our inward man is not dependent upon happenings for happiness. Our inward man does not react to disappointments the way our outward man does. In verse 17, this apostle continues, my Lord, he continues by saying, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. How many you know that our light afflictions, our afflictions that we face day after day after day, is it work for us? It's going to work something good for us. Dear God, give Him your praise if you understand that God is not against you because of a preaching, but He's with you. And in the last verse of that chapter, Paul gives the church the, the secret ingredient to a powerful, overcoming, victorious life. He said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you are here this morning and you're discouraged, you were discouraged by something that you saw. If you're here disappointed, that disappointment stems from something that you have observed with the physical eye. If you are defeated, that defeat is a product of something that the outward man saw. If you're sad, your sadness is a product of something that the outward man has viewed. Any negative feeling.
feeling or reaction that you and I are having today has to do with something that the temporal man has seen. Paul puts that overcoming ability into practice in verse 11 through 17 of 1 Timothy. He's surrounded by problems that he can see. False teachers in the church. A desire of redeemed souls to return to the law. A temptation within the body to give heed to fables and endless genealogies. From experience I can tell you as a minister these things can produce grief. But Paul refuses to concentrate on those negative things that he can see with a physical eye. He has trained himself to look past the present past the obvious, obvious and of course the inward man to concentrate on things that are hidden from the outward man. If all that you and I are concentrating on is what we can see with this physical eye, it's a given that we're discouraged. It's a given that we're depressed. Oh, but there are other things. Things that you and I cannot see. Things that you cannot touch. Things sometimes you cannot feel there's a God that has yes. everything yes. under control yes. even our lives yes. Paul pulls his attention away from the problems that the church is facing and instead of complaining about those griefs he thanks God for counting him faithful and permitted him to be a minister I don't know about you, but I did not deserve Calvary. I did not deserve salvation. Is there anybody here that said, Pastor, I deserve what God gave me. Not one living, breathing soul, but He saved me anyway. That's worthy of concentrating on. That's worthy of looking at with a mind. That God, who is rich in grace and mercy, has called us not to be servants, but to be sons and daughters Amen. of the Most High God. The most powerful figure in the New Testament outside of Christ Himself was Paul who was once a blasphemer, once a persecutor. This man who now was in charge of the churches was at one time injurious to the believer, persecuted them for Christ's sake. But Paul praised God for something that the outward man could not see. Something that could not be viewed by the physical eye. He said, in spite of all of these evil practices, I obtain mercy. Right. You say, preacher, you're preaching the, the same message you preached last week. Wrong. I'm just saying some of the same things. I'm just hitting on some of the most important things in our life. He said, but I obtain mercy. My God, when I was uh, uh, doing the church wrong, when I was injuring uh, fellow believers, uh, when I was walking uh, outside of God's will, He found me and I obtain mercy. Problems have a form. They reveal themselves to the physical eye. Daily we're presented with physical things which worry us and upset us. But mercy has no form. And mercy presents no picture. Mercy is a spiritual act that chooses not to reveal itself physically. And yet the greatest gift ever received by man is mercy. Total, absolute destruction or a product of uh, 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 its action. Eternal punishment is unavoidable for all those who die outside of God's mercy. Uh, but Paul says, uh, that's not me. I'm not in that category for I have obtained mercy. Amen. Amen. Not God in heaven. Praise God. Let me stop there just a minute. Do you remember the day that mercy fell on you? Amen, yes. Dear God, if we can't remember that day, it probably didn't take place. How many remember the day that when God, wouldn't, or if it had worked out the way that it should, if we got what we were worth, 
then we would have been punished ourselves. But one day, mercy came to where we was because we didn't know where mercy was. But mercy hunted us up. Mercy came to us. Mercy bestowed itself upon our hearts, upon our lives. Dear God, I don't have much money. I don't have this. I don't have that. This is wrong. That's wrong. Dear God, I wish things would change. You wish things would change. But I have obtained mercy. We're an artist to succeed in drawing a picture of mercy. That drawing would be priceless could we take what is in our heart and transfer it to a canvas. What a price it would bring. But mercy has no form. Mercy has no features. Mercy has no defining lines. And yet mercy is worth more than nations. Mercy is worth more than kingdoms and it's worth more than any priceless jewel. And although every born again believer possesses it, we spend our time viewing our sadness and viewing our sorrow and viewing our disappointments and our defeats because each of them have a face. Although we possess the priceless gift of mercy, because it cannot be viewed by the physical eye. Right. We choose to look at things far less worthy of our effort and far less worthy of our time. We look at problems. We look at worries. We look at catastrophes. And what we look at determines what kind of a life we live. While instructing Timothy on church problems that would directly affect the apostles himself, Paul turns his spiritual eyes toward the exceeding abundant grace of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. We're living in a world and if we don't learn how to do that, if we don't learn how to look away from the problems and the difficulties that surround us, then we would be a, a good candidate to be put in a mental institution somewhere because there's enough going on in my life and enough going on in your life to push us over the edge. But every once in a while, I've got to remind myself, this is not home. This is not my home. This is not your home. My God, I have obtained mercy and you have too. Amen. While instructing Timothy on church problems, he thinks about the grace of God like mercy. Grace has no portrait. You cannot visit an art gallery and purchase a picture that describes grace to the physical eye. I can see the things that are producing difficulty in my life. Raise your hand if you can see the things that are causing difficulty in your life. In my mind, there are visible images of things that are hindering my temporal success. Satan is a master at presenting hurtful, discouraging pictures to the temporal mind. And the sad thing is, those are the only pictures that many believers ever see. Our victory as believers does not come through things that we can easily see with a physical eye. Our victory comes through through the ability to view with the spiritual eye what cannot be seen by the temporal man. He said, Preacher, I can't see heaven. No, you cannot. For I have not seen and ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those that love him. But he also said, I where I go. I'm going to come back and take you that there you may be. Also, let me tell you something. There is enough of heaven in this book. You and I revealed enough of heaven in this book to bypass some of the adversity that we're encountering and look at heaven instead of the problems that surround us. Give God praise if you believe that. Well, completely surrounded by problems. We must be capable of seeing a place where problems do not exist. Although the Word declares that I have not seen as I just stated, 
We provided all kinds of pictures in the Word of God of heaven. If the temporal man possesses the ability to see those things that are troubling him, then surely the spirit man has been given enough information to form a picture of a place where trouble does not exist. Revelation 21, John tells us that he saw a new heaven. He said, I saw a new earth. He said, he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned right. for her husband. Yeah. He tells us that God shall wipe away all tears. Right. There shall be no death there. There shall be no sorrow there. There shall be no crying there. There shall be no pain there. God, can we have a picture of what heaven's going to be like? Amen. Can we form in our mind some kind of a picture of what awaits us after the adversary has tempted us for the last time? After you and have put for our last battle, what is heaven going to be like to put our mind and our attention on something that is eternal and put it away from something that is temporal? You know what? You have and I have said this about our problems. This is never going to go away. Have you ever said that? Have you ever felt that way? That this is one problem that is going to die with you. You're going to have this problem for the rest of your life. But listen to me. The Bible says that weeping doesn't last forever. Right. Weeping endures for a night. Joy comes in the morning. Amen. The sun's going to come up on the rainiest days. He's going to quit and the sun's going to come out. How many of you know that? Yeah. Dear God, the greatest storm may be blowing and ripping up the roofs off of houses, but sooner or later it's going to lay down and be quiet and we're going to continue our lives. Yeah. Get your eye on the prize. Get your eye on the prize. My God, get your eye on something eternal and away from the temporal. If we can permit what we see presently with a physical eye to completely destroy our joy, then can we look into Scripture and by faith believe that what He said is true and consequently come to the conclusion that our problems are short in duration, that weeping takes place today or tonight, and God's joy is coming in the morning. Amen. As long as our ability to see is governed by what is taking place in our lives presently, our life will not experience excitement, but our lifestyle shall be one of dread. Is there anybody here that's ever dreaded to see the sun come up? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I know you have. I mean, when the adversary really deals you a bad hand, I'm not talking about just mediocre. I'm talking about a bad hand. You've got a bad hand and you're going to face it tomorrow. How many can remember times dreading the sun, to see the sun come up? But it came up anyway. Amen. We dealt with it and we're still here. Amen. The greatest problem that I have ever faced, I had to deal with it because it wouldn't go away. But thank God, it did go away. Just like God said, all of them will. If you will now just get him by the hand and walk with him. Let him lead us, guide us, Amen. cast all our cares upon him because he cares for you. There could be no gladness in the announcement to go to the house of the Lord as long as all you can see is more sorrow, more pain, and consequently more difficulties. You're not long to be a doorkeeper in the house of God as long as uh, all you are seeing are the temporal pictures of what's going on in your life. You cannot and I cannot get excited about God and His church as long as you have more pictures of suffering. 
Like Paul, we must change what we are looking at. Some way, somehow, we've got to let God, God, through His Spirit, direct our inward man to see what's really real. What's going on around us is not going to go on forever. And some of it's not even really real. It's just something to tear our world apart. Just something to keep us upset. But I'll tell you something that is real. God Almighty is real. Amen. I said God Almighty is real. And God's Spirit is real. And God's Spirit is real in my heart. And God's Spirit is real in your heart. Lord God, we don't have to live through this world. We don't have to walk through this world with our heads bowed down. There's enough excitement already taking place in our lives to keep us rejoicing Amen. until Jesus Amen. comes. Amen. Amen. Come on. The Bible speaks to us of a, a song that the redeemed are going to sing in heaven. Also lets us know that the angels can't sing that song. Right. They can't sing it because they wouldn't know what they were singing about. They were never guilty of sin. Right. They never had to blaspheme God. They had not taken God's name in vain. It's going to be for men and women that were so undeserving and yet God came to you and God came to me. Lord God, I want to feel my spot in that choir. I want to sing about the redemption that became mine. I want to sing about salvation that kept me through this world who walked with me and talked with me and told me that I was His own. I want to be a part of heaven's power when it echoes by God on the hillsides of glory and the angels stand back in awe and listen. Yes. Yes. If what we're receiving presently is all there is, how could we possibly get excited? Practically everyone that we talk to has something to say about Never seen things or times like they're witnessing today. Finding a picture that oppresses us is no problem. It's looking for something to get excited about that consumes our effort. But the problem is not that exciting things for the believer do not exist. It's that the pictures of biblical things viewed by the temporal man has taken control of our mind. Tell me, undeserving man. Tell me, undeserving woman. How exciting is it to know that while we desire, desire God's wrath or deserve God's wrath, instead He bestowed mercy. Nothing stood between our eternal damnation and our eternal reward except that one word, mercy. Is there anybody here besides the pastor saying, Pastor, I deserve hell. If I got what I deserved, I deserve to go to hell. But how many you know that you bypassed hell? And the way you bypassed hell was through the blood of Jesus Christ that He applied to your heart and to your life. That's something to get excited about. I don't know if they're ever going to have any of hell again. I don't know if the baseball is ever going to come back. I don't know if the NBA is ever going to return. But this I know. I'll die being saved by the grace of God. You'll get excited and you bet your life I am. Several years ago, I stood in what remains of the Colosseum in Rome. In that Colosseum, men called gladiators fought. In a balcony overlooking the arena, an individual appointed by Caesar watched the fights. And when one of the gladiators had overcome his opponent, this man who Caesar had appointed would make the decision whether the defeated contestant would live or die. The crowd had the ability to sway his decision as they shouted, kill him, kill him, this powerful individual who held life and 
death in his hand. Gave the signal of life with a thumbs up. A signal to die with a thumbs down. Life was in his hands. It was all what he had to say. In a spiritual manner, you and I have been in that arena. The powerful individual making the decision of our life. Our death was Jesus Christ. If we had received justice, we would have all died. All of us would have received the thumbs down, but our merciful Lord gave us the thumbs up yeah, yeah. and we're alive. How can any problem, regardless of its extremity, ever compare with mercy that was extended and partaken of? Yeah. How can you and I put mercy on the back burner while we look at the temporal problems that life has dealt us. I'm saved. I'm saved. You said, preacher, that's an elementary statement. You don't have anything else to say? Honey, that's as high as I can go. I am redeemed. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we come out and redeemed. God, you didn't walk where I walked. I didn't walk where you walked. But it was a dark, dirty place where I was at. A bad place. A dangerous place. A hateful place. A painful place. I must see and people say, well, you know God wouldn't be there. You know God wouldn't go there. I was sitting on a bar in Heidelberg, Germany one night. And the Spirit of God came into that bar where I was and convicted my heart. Don't tell me where God will go. God will go where you are. God will go where I am. God will go where He's needed. Amen. In the spiritual manner, you and I have been there for the grace that Christ bestowed, the undeserved favor of God. Paul develops a picture in these few verses, a picture of great things that have happened. To every believer that puts the picture of trial and difficulty that are faced daily to shame. Not things that he's going to do for us. Things he's already done for us. God doesn't need to do something else in order to gain my praise. God need not do another thing for me. For me to worship and praise Him. Lord God, He's already done more than I ever deserve or ever thought I'd ever have. <coughs> Son of a king. Daughter of a king. Is that worthy of turning your mind and your attention away from the temporal difficulties? Long enough to praise Him for where He brought you from. Right, amen. Amen. And where He has placed you. He speaks of a God who trusted him. Of a God who enabled him and counted him faithful. Presenting him with a position in the ministry. We need to consider that. God has entrusted you with a position in the ministry. Oh, everybody's not preachers. Everyone's not singers, but these men minister. Just like I minister. You Sunday school teachers, you minister just like I minister. All of us have got a ministry. There is the picture of a blasphemer, persecutor, that had injured the church, being given a power position in it, of God's abundant grace becoming his, and that his sins were forgiven even though he counted himself to be chief among sinners for all these favors. Paul gives praise unto the eternal King. Immortal, invisible, the only wise God, and he believes on him for life everlasting and his period forever and ever. If possible, for a lifestyle that was birthed in glory to become wonder of dread. What was begun in a spirit of excitement can become something that we must force ourselves to do. There are many even within the church who are continuing on because they do not want to go to hell. 
And while hell is certainly a place to be shunned, escaping that burning inferno should not be our chief reason for continuing our walk with Jesus Christ. We should follow Jesus because we desire to do so because we love Him. Because we love Him. And we should desire to follow Him because it is exciting. As Peter declares, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. My generation, our generation, going to set the pace for the church of tomorrow. We're going to say that with our lives and the way we live it, that God is indeed God and there's nothing that He cannot do. We're going to say it to our children. We're going to say it to our grandchildren. We're going to say it to the young men and the young women that attend our church that the God that we're serving is able to see us through it all. I declare unto you under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask for things according to the power that works within us. How many can raise your hand and say, Pastor, I, I have been down and I don't like it. Is there anybody here besides me that's ever been down? Did you like it? That's when the adversary makes you a, a floor mat. Walks all over you and shows you all the bad things. that are happening. God fix our vision this morning. Let us see what's really happening. We're walking toward eternity. Every day that passes, we're that much closer to eternity. And we're not walking by ourselves. He said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I'll go with you always, even to the end of the world. When we get to Chile, Jordan, we won't have to wait on him. He'll be there with us. Let me tell you something, church. Spiritually, if we know Jesus, we've got it made. Amen. When you look at it in temporal terms, we may not be that lucky. But spiritually, if we know Jesus and He knows us, we've got it made. Amen. Because this world is going to pass away with fervent heat. But you and I are going to be gone. Crystal River, come to your music, please. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you be honest with me this morning and say, Pastor, I, I'm, I, I'm hurting. Things are not going the way that I want them to go. There's a lot of bad things right. going on in my life right now. I wish I could change, but I can't. And it's consuming my time. I know this message was as much for me as it was for you. But God's got you. And God has got me. He's not just got my back. He's got all of me. And he's got all of you. And there's one verse of scripture that you and I need to lean on heavily. For God will not allow you to be tempted about that which you're able. But with every temptation shall also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. Stand with me, please. Crystal River, sing us a song. Like a nurse taking your blood pressure. The young people around us are looking at us trying to figure out what we're going to do because they figure if we do it that way, it'll work for them. I don't want to lead anybody astray. I, I don't want anybody to think that my problem is bigger than my God is. I don't want not one person to leave this place this morning thinking that, that my back's against the wall or your back's against the wall. Honey, that ain't, that ain't the way it happens. God may allow us to stand still for a little while. Never once does he say retreat. Always it's forward. 
or stand still and see the salvation of God. God has got your hand. If you've got His and you want to walk with Him, God's going to bring us through Amen. these great difficulties that we're encountering. Yeah. God is going to see us through. We'll look back at them just like we look back at the ones we've already faced.